that this is a really tough time for all of us. Hope you're doing well and safe at home, hopefully. Um, and knowing that this is only temporary, we will get through this together. Kudos to all of you attending now for using this time wisely and update your knowledge. I know that there seems to be bad news every day, but I really encourage you to look for the positive side of this time. Maybe it's time to connect with your loved ones and maybe it's time to reevaluate your business plans or learn new skills, or perhaps it's time to do your homework and finally launch that business idea of yours. So that's why uh, owner is here trying to help. We know that many small business owners are struggling at this time, and we that's why we put out this free webinar trying to educate and help you save on tax in the future. Today, we have invited a small business tax expert, Anna, to teach us on the tax basics. But before Anna starts, um, I'd like to have June to demonstrate how to register or incorporate a business using owner's platform. So that's the majority of the learning today. And uh, in order to keep the pace going, I have I uh, believe I have muted all of you, but feel free to use the chat function uh, as we just tested at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions during their presentation. They'll try their best to, to answer as they were presenting, but otherwise, if there's any burning questions afterwards, after each presentation, we will also unmute all of you so you can ask questions directly. So without further ado, let's just jump right in and get started. Uh, well, I have a, one question already. Will, will you send the materials out? That's a great question. Uh, we are actually, I believe we are recording this uh, webinar. So afterwards, we will share that in, uh, in the follow-up email with you. So thanks for asking. Now let's get into the registration part. June is our owner's customer success lead. She's very passionate about helping aspiring entrepreneurs to get started. And when she's not working, June likes travel and outdoor activities. She also loves her side hustle of the motherhood for these two beautiful girls, three and five. And that's why we scheduled her demo first before she has to serve her bedtime duty. So June's going to be with us for the next 20 to 30 minutes to take you through the registration process. Depending on your business type, uh, especially for incorporation, it could be quite confusing trying to educate yourself and browsing uh, different government websites. So June's going to demonstrate how to get that through owner's process. And in the process of that, you will learn everything you need to know about the key requirements for registration. So. Without further ado, let's uh, just get it started. June, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, so I'll just jump right into it. Um, so why do you need to register your business in the first place? Um, what are you doing when you register your business? Basically, you're, you are telling the, the government that you are operating a business. You're telling the government um, the business address, where it's located um, and its name if you're if you're operating using a business name um, and you need to do this in order to basically set up your business so for example if you need to open up a, a business bank account for your business the bank will ask to see proof that you have a registered business with the, your provincial government um, if you are collecting GST or HST um, and, and you're using a, a business name, the CRA will ask you what business name uh, is attached to your, to attach to your GST account to. Uh, registering also helps uh, to establish credibility and an identity for your business. And finally, it can also help to grow your team. So if you need to do things like hire employees, you'll need to uh, pay them. So you'll need to um, enroll in, in CRA's payment uh, payroll. Uh, program and to do that you, you need to have a registered business. So formalizing your business with the government is often the first step in, in, in setting yourself up um, and setting up the different uh, government services that you'll, you'll need to do to get your business going. 
so when you when you register your business, you're simultaneously choosing a structure for that business. So there's kind of three main structures, sole proprietorship, which is a one person business. There's partnership, which is for two or more people, as well as incorporation, which is for one or more individuals. Uh, for this presentation, uh, we'll go over sole proprietorship registration as well as incorporation. Uh, but you should kind of note that partnership is an option as well. So with, with sole proprietorship, um, it's just one business owner. So, you know, you have full control over the decisions in the business. It's pretty low startup costs. So you can get started for about $90 to $120, depending on the province that you're in. All the profits are yours because you're the sole business owner. And this offers a simplified tax structure and, and tax benefits as well. So your um, income and your, your expenses related to your business uh, are part of your personal income tax return. Uh, some challenges with this type of registration is that you do have unlimited liability. Um, raising money can be more difficult. So um, uh, some investors, um, some funding programs, grants and things like that may require incorporation. You don't have any business name protection. So your, your business name does get registered with the government. It becomes part of the public record, but it's not protected in any way. And then finally, the lifespan of the business is the same as a business owner. So in this way, there is really no distinction between the business itself and the, and the business owner. They are one and the same. So with incorporation, it's, you're basically creating a separate legal entity, and this provides some benefits and some challenges as well. So with incorporation, the decisions are made by the directors and the corporation. You can incorporate as a one-person company, and you can also have multiple directors in, in the corporation as well. There's limited liability in that um, it is a separate legal entity, so there is some protection for the business owners with this type of business structure. It can be easier to grow and raise money. And then the business has an unlimited lifespan. So it continues on despite changes in the ownership of the corporation. There is some business name protection in that uh, another company could not incorporate with the exact same name in the jurisdiction that you incorporated in. So there's a little bit of name protection with incorporation. Some of the challenges, so you, you are governed under um, uh, some legislation so there you know you have to um, keep corporate records um, and you have to comply with the, the legislation for your province um, it's a little bit more expensive to get set up so it's between about 600 to 700 dollars and a little bit more paperwork to stay active so you do need to do things something called an annual filing where you're telling the government that your corporation is still a going concern and, and active and then finally when you, when you have multiple people involved in the corporation, multiple directors and shareholders, it's a little bit more complex and can, can lead to a little bit more conflict um, during the course of business. So it's kind of the two, two structures um, that owner helps to register. Just gonna pause there for a second to see if anyone has any questions. You can send them through on the chat if you do. Good, all right. Um, so then one other thing that you might want to think about uh, when you're setting up your business. So once, once you've told the provincial government that you're operating a business, another thing that is on the minds of a lot of business owners is uh, registering for CRA program accounts. Um, so the most common one is GST or HST registration. So this is if you're collecting, collecting tax from your, from your customers, you'll need to register for, for that type of account. Um, and another common one is import um, and, and export if you're importing or exporting goods. Uh, so you can do these directly with the Canada Revenue Agency, and then you would do these after um, you had uh, registered your business. Um, and in some cases, if you incorporate, you're often assigned a federal business number automatically, but that doesn't necessarily enroll you automatically in a, in a program account. So one of the things you want to think about when you're registering your business is if any of these programs are applicable to you, and then you would proceed with setting them up as well. 
Uh, so I see one question here for imports or the customs taxes paid through this account. Uh, so it's more of a CRA question. Um, we're, you know, kind of, we're experts at the, the business registration, setting up your, your business, uh, but we're not as familiar with uh, the CRA program accounts. Um, we, we kind of guide our users towards uh, the CRA quite a bit because it's something that people are, are setting up after they set up their business, but we're not necessarily experts in these programs at this time. Okay. Uh, so with owner, what we've done is we basically made it a lot easier for you to register and launch your business. Uh, so we have a business registration service, so we can help you to register as a sole proprietor or as a corporation in Ontario, Alberta, or BC. We also have a, a logo service powered by AI where you can start branding your, your business and, and get files uh, to fit social media accounts and things like that. Uh, we also have a partnership with RBC. So if you need financial services and you need to open up a business bank account, you can get money back on your registration. And then finally, we also have negotiated exclusive partner perks and offers. Um, to help you save money as you begin your business journey. So I'm just going to switch here to a quick demo of incorporation. Let's get back here. There are any other questions? You can also shoot them through through the chat. Oh, I've got one there. If you have two businesses that do two separate things, where you're a sole owner, should you incorporate both businesses separately? So there's there's a couple options when you're operating two businesses. Uh, so if you're a sole proprietor, you can just register multiple business names, um, and you, it is also possible to incorporate multiple businesses. Uh, but just keep in mind that if you do that, you are maintaining multiple corporations. Um, so uh, we always say it's you know good to talk to an accountant, to talk to a lawyer, um, to see what what might be the best setup for you. You can also do things like um, have subsidiaries, branches, or divisions under a corporation for more complex setups. Owner is not really set up for that, but certainly it is possible uh, to do more complex setups like that. I've got another question here. I have an existing business, a corporation. Um, what services or benefits do you offer? Uh, so uh, yeah, if you already have a registered corporation or registered business, so you can still create an account with owner um, and access the logo service um, and also the exclusive uh, perks and offers. Um, and then one more question, wouldn't it be better so one business isn't responsible for the other business losses? So again, this is more bordering on legal or accounting advice. Um, we've automated the process of business registration, but we're not, uh, we're not accountants, we're not lawyers, so we're not able to provide that type of advice. Uh, but certainly we recommend talking to professionals who can advise you on, on things like that. Um, okay, I'm just gonna take one more question here before getting into the demo. Uh, so my business will be a mobile app. Have people used owner to register mobile app businesses? Uh, so yes, uh, owners registered all kinds of businesses from uh, tech businesses to consulting to restaurants uh, to contractors and things like that. Um, um, and can we incorporate federally or provincially? So we do, in Ontario, we do offer either provincial incorporation or federal incorporation. The main difference is business name protection across Ontario or business name protection across uh, Canada. And also the timeline for how long it takes to incorporate. Federal takes a little bit longer as there's a governing, governing body that reviews your business name to make sure it's not uh, too similar to other names across Canada. Um, and then the app will be in the Apple App Store, distributed globally, uh, which one, yeah. So it's, it's, it's up to you. You can either be a provincial corporation or a federal corporation. The main, the main difference is, is name, uh, name protection uh, in the jurisdiction in which you register. Okay, so I'm just going to launch here into um, a demo. So owner does provide access to the business name database where you can search for up to 30 uh, business names. Um, so it, it, it will 
give you feedback on trademarks, corporate names across Canada, as well as business registrations in Canada. So I'm just gonna type in here, Sunshine Bakery. So it's giving me some feedback here. You cannot register the name entered. It's already in use by incorporated company. I'll try June Sunshine Bakery. So first it checks for trademarks. Says there's no trademarks found. Uh, checks for other corporate names across Canada. There's no corporate names found. And then it checks for registrations in Canada and then no, no business names found. So this is a really great tool for kind of playing around. Um, it's always best to have your, your business name be as unique as, as possible. Um, and the, the business name search database is a great resource uh, to help you do that. So you'll answer some questions about the name. Uh, so is it my own name or my initials? Yes. First part of the name, yes. So I should say here, this is an incorporation application. So it's a bit longer, sole proprietorship. Um, basically you would do name search exactly what, as we did, provide some business details and then pay and submit. Um, and then depending on your province, it's one business day uh, in BC, it's about three weeks or so uh, to get back your registration. So it's a, it's a more simplified process, uh, but we're just gonna show you incorporation so you get an idea of what this looks like. So here you'll choose a legal ending for your business name. It doesn't matter what you choose, whatever you prefer. You'll choose an industry, uh, one line description describing your business, and then your, your company's fiscal year end. So every business does need a physical business address uh, located in the province in which you're registering. So you'll enter that. And this is for incorporation. This is not part of a sole proprietorship registration, but for incorporation, this is where you'll assign the membership and roles in your corporation. So there needs to be one incorporator, that's the person uh, incorporating the company, uh, or the person filling out the so at least one director, this is who owns the business, and then at least two officers, the president and secretary. So if you're one person, you would just assign yourself all of these roles, and here you'll just add their name, their email, address, and uh, phone number, and whether or not they have shares. So for this corporation, I've got two people involved. Um, so June Smith is the incorporator. John and June are both the directors. June is the president, and then John is the secretary. And here's where you'll sign um, shares and ownership in your corporation. So we've got this is where you'll decide a price per share and also the number of shares that you're assigning to each person. So what, what you put in here is up to you. We're not able to, again, provide any um, accounting advice uh, around what happens here. Um, but basically the idea is you are just assigning ownership in the corporation. Um, so uh, here in this example, I've got $1 per share. I've assigned myself 40 shares. We'll open the corporate bank account. I'll pay forty dollars for those forty shares, and I'll for own forty percent of the or own forty percent of the company. I guess John is going to own forty percent of the company. Uh, June Smith here uh, is going to have sixty shares, pay sixty dollars, and then own sixty percent of the corporation. So this is where you'll just review your. In information. So with owner, all the information is submitted electronically to the government as entered. It's always a good idea to make sure everything is spelled correctly and divided correctly the way you intend. Uh, then you would pay and submit. That would get you a name search report, uh, which is a more comprehensive um, uh, report of business names that are similar to yours. And then you would come back and submit your incorporation. Um, and the timeline for that, uh, it varies depending on the province. It can be one or two business days. Um, uh, in BC, it's a little bit longer, about three weeks right now. And then with federal incorporation in Ontario, uh, it's about a week or so. So again, this is for incorporation. Uh, with sole proprietorship, it's a bit simpler, just your name search, some business details, and then, and then payment. You don't have to do things like roles or, or shares and things like that.
So I'm going to stop there. So thank you for joining us tonight. We do have um, a special coupon for you uh, if you do decide to register your business with Owner. So you can get $50 off your registration uh, using this coupon code here. So tax, all in capital letters, 50 at the checkout. And through our partnership with RBC, you can also get money back if you open up a business bank account for your business. Uh, so if you incorporate, you can get 319 back. If you register as a sole proprietorship, you would get back uh, the amount you paid. All right, so I'm going to, we can take some questions again through the chat. So you see a couple here. Uh, so how do we protect the name globally? Um, so uh, something like a, a trademark is, is done across Canada. Um, I don't know about global protection. Um, it's very jurisdictional. Um, I don't know if there's another uh, body that you might want to do some research into, but um, something like business registration is done province by province. Um, something like trademark protection, which is the highest level of name protection in Canada, is done at the federal level. And then above that, I'm not, I'm not as um, familiar with the process for that. There might be, be something like that. Um, we just kind of know mostly for, for Canada. Um, but yeah, it, it might be possible. Um, and then, yeah, one more question about the, can the same person be president and secretary? Yes. So if you're a one person corporation, you could be the president, the secretary, uh, the director and the incorporator. Uh, one question here about sole proprietorship registration with owner also includes GST and import export. Yeah, good question. Um, so with sole proprietorship, uh, we are not uh, tied into the CRA programs at this time. Uh, so you would basically register your business. Uh, once you have your documentation, then you would contact the CRA to do the GST and import export um, enrollment directly with the CRA. Okay, anything else? All right, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Uh, you can always get in touch with us directly on our website. Uh, we're also available uh, by phone. You can also chat with us um, during business hours on the site. Uh, so thanks so much for, for joining us. I hope that gives you a bit of understanding. Um, <laughs> proprietorship uh, and incorporation. Oops, uh, <laughs> I was trying to unmute everyone so you can get a chance, but sounds like there's a lot of background noise. So I would just remind uh, everyone, if you're not asking the question, can you please mute yourself? And I'm going to try one more time to unmute everyone if you have any remainder questions that you want to ask June directly. And I just want to remind you guys, this is your last chance to ask June about registration. Otherwise, she will leave us uh, shortly. Questions? All right, so I guess we will rely on the chat uh, just to keep it more organized. Uh, so I do see one more question here about converting business to um, uh, a, a limited liability later. later. So um, uh, yeah, you can, you can incorporate your business at any time. Um, you can, which basically means you're just changing your business structure. So if you're a sole proprietorship now, what you would do is you would incorporate, uh, and then once your corporation exists, then you would cancel your sole proprietorship registration with, with the government. Can you change from provincial to federal? Uh, so with incorporation, you have a choice to incorporate provincially or federally. Uh, it's generally best to choose the one that you need up front. It is possible to change. It's called a continuance, but it's quite um, difficult, like challenging bureaucratic, basically, process. You're, you're, you would have to kind of get permission from the provincial government to exit uh, the legislation under which you're 
governed and then permission from the federal government to enter that legislation. So um, we, we generally say that when you're incorporating, uh, choose one or the other, the one that suits you best, and then kind of start, start, start the, in the way that you uh, intend. Uh, it is possible to change, but it's um, uh, a bit of a, a process to do so. Uh, so what is the main difference? Is that referring to provincial versus federal? Um, so the main difference again is, is name protection um, in the jurisdiction. So provincial name protection versus federal name protection and then the length of time it takes to get incorporated. Um, so I think I'll take just uh, one more question so that we can get on to Anna's presentation. So how long does it take to get a business name incorporated here in Canada and cost? Um, so it depends a little bit on the province you're in, um, but basically it, it can range from one to two business days. Uh, in BC, it's about three weeks, uh, and then the price is about uh, about six to seven hundred dollars, also depending on the province. Uh, so in Ontario, it would be six nineteen plus tax uh, is the cost for incorporation. Um, provincial incorporation is two business days and federal incorporations about five business days or a little bit longer, depending on if the government has, has feedback. All right, everyone, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up here and um, let Anna take over to teach you about tax. Thank you, June, that's awesome. Jesse, can you guys hear me? Je Jesse, do you wanna start? Can Sorry, you guys... I was on mute. I was on mute, my apologies. Thank you so much, June. Uh, so, uh, in case you have more questions, feel free to reach out to us afterwards to the owner's team, or you can book June for a one-on-one -on -one, uh, free consultation to talk about business registration. So uh, if you have, I know a lot of people seem very interested in that uh, because of the time restriction, we only have so much time, uh, but we have lots of time to connect after the, uh, the webinar. So stay tuned. Um, and now I'm going to turn over to Anna, our next presenter. She's not just a tax, uh, tax expert. She's also a business owner herself. And Anna is an accountant by trade, of course, but she realized her true passion was in helping small businesses. And that's why she started her own business, Actium Consulting, 18 years ago. And since then, she's been training various small businesses and self-employed entrepreneurs. In the next little while, uh, next half an hour or so, Anna is going to talk about the most important things about business taxes. So Anna, the floor is yours. Show us the money. Guys, thanks so much, Jesse, and thank you, Drew. And that on oh, that's in the background. Um, I appreciate all you guys joining us tonight. I know it's a very unusual and interesting times right now, especially um, in my business. It's been a very, very interesting uh, last two weeks. So we do appreciate you guys being here and all your time. And as Jesse mentioned, yeah, my business is actually helping other small businesses. So we assist small businesses uh, with their bookkeeping, with their year end accounting. And also my main, I started my business setting up small clients on different accounting software. And so getting them automated and efficient and getting their businesses running. So Tonight, we're going to discuss um, self-employment and incorporated business taxes. So we'll talk about tax deductions, sales taxes, income taxes, and CPP, and some of the differences between being self-employed versus incorporated. So what is business income exactly? We say that that is income from selling a service or product to others. So this can be what we call B to C, or B2B, so a business to a consumer or a customer, or your business to another business. Business income, though, does not include any employment income, such as wages or salaries received from an employer, or right now could potentially be EI for some people, okay? So it's at actual things you sell. It could be your own time, your services, or products. So your net business income, though, is calculated based on that gross revenue that you brought in, less any expenses or what everybody likes to call write-offs. This is what you are taxed on, okay? So your net business income is your taxable income. Everybody's favorite topic, what can I write off, right? 
So expenses are to be incurred to earn business income in order to qualify as a write-off. So when claiming business expenses in Canada, the Canada Revenue Agency or CRA allows any reasonable business expense. So clearly that's open to interpretation. However, it really needs to be appropriate for your business and used in an attempt to earn income or make money, okay? So you do need to be really careful to not try to deduct that family vacation to the all-inclusive in Mexico <laughs> as a business expense. However, home office and your automobile use can be prorated based on the amount of business use, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Some common business deductions we often see are things like your cell phone, very common, professional fees, office fees. Meals and entertainment is always an interesting one because the government says you still have to eat, whether you are self-employed or not, and whether you're working or not. So only 50% of the meals and entertainment that you incur can be deducted. And there has to be more than one meal on that receipt, okay? That's the big thing here. Many people think, well, I was working and I went to Tim Hortons or I went to this restaurant and got myself lunch, but it was while I was working, so I'm writing that off. That does not qualify. That gets a zero deduction, okay? You have to have taken out a colleague, a potential customer, a prospect, somebody you're doing business with, your, your favorite accountant maybe, I don't know, that, um, and then it will qualify for the 50% meals and entertainment deduction. So more and more self-employed Canadians are opting for home offices, and it makes a ton of sense, as we all now see these days, um, much different than when I did this presentation a few weeks ago. <laughs> What a difference. But uh, working from home does have its perks, especially when your kids aren't in the background, um, such as avoiding the daily commute, being able to balance your home and business better, and in some cases, being able to hold meetings in your PJs. I'm sure nobody's in their PJs right now, right? I totally am. No, I'm kidding. Um, so an added bonus, though, is that the CRA will permit self-employed Canadians to deduct expenses related to earning profits in their home-based businesses, which then reduces the amount of net income in that business, therefore reducing your tax. So the CRA states that you can deduct expenses for the business use of a workspace in your home as long as you meet one of the following criteria. It is your principal place of business, so this is where you run your whole business out of, or you use this space to earn business income on a regular and ongoing basis where you're meeting clients, customers, patients, whatever it is. But it can't be, say, 5% of the time. If you have an outside office or an outside place of work and you only use your, office, your home at night, maybe to answer some emails and things like that, it would not qualify for the home office deduction. Okay. So it's based on square footage. If your home office, say, takes up 10% of the square footage of your home. Like, let's say you have a condo, 1,000 square foot condo, and you measure out your space that you use. Maybe it's a spare bedroom or, or a corner that you have, let's say 10 by 10. And 10% of that space is used as a true home office. You can claim 10% of the utilities, insurance, rent, property taxes, and mortgage interest. Vehicle is very similar. So when you're self-employed or you have self-employed income, the CRA allows you to take a deduction for the number of kilometers that you rack up for business-related activities. Now the big caveat is that in order to calculate your deduction properly, you need to keep track of all your business trips throughout the year and also hang on to any receipts for vehicle-related purchases. That includes gas, um, maintenance, everything. To claim this deduction, you must, must always have a logbook. Okay, so that, that journals your travel activities. I've been doing this, as Jesse mentioned, a long time because, you know, I, I started when I was five, I think. Um, and so um, the, I've never seen them do a vehicle expense audit and not ask for a logbook. 
Okay, so just be aware that if you were to have your expenses reviewed by the CRA, they will absolutely ask to see your vehicle log where you're tracking your business kilometers. Okay, so you can um, digitize your receipts. There's lots of apps out there that help you with that. So you don't have to keep all the little slips that come out of the gas pumps and, and whatnot. You can, the CRA will accept digitized receipts, but the most important is to keep track of how many kilometers you drove for business and how many kilometers you drove in total in the year. And then same as the home office, you take a percentage. So if half of the time, 50% of your kilometers were for business, according to your logbook, then you can take 50% of all of your car expenses. You cannot use a per kilometer rate just be aware of that. Many people who have been employed in the past, there is a per kilometer rate um, stated by the CRA every year. That is for employees only, not when you're self-employed. So big ticket items. What is capital property? These are items that have a useful life generally of a year or more. So if the expenditure is expected to help the company generate revenue for a long period of time, you should record it as an asset and not an expense. And then you depreciate it over its useful life. So the decision on whether to capitalize, so we call that capitalizing, whatever that cost was, is a critical business decision because it can influence the profit and loss of your business. So your P&L or your profit and loss results in turn affect the business's net worth, its tax liability, and potential debt covenants. So if you capitalize it, only a portion of the expense is deducted year over year over the useful life of the asset. So this slide now, I just want to put it out there before we talk, but it is just um, a generalization and an estimate for most people we see um, small businesses that come to us. So if you're self-employed, Taxes not only become a major part of running your business, but they have a significant impact on your net cash flow. So one of the biggest things we see that kills small businesses is cash flow, honestly. Um, so we estimate for most small businesses to keep 30 to 35% of your business income. So that's your gross business income, what you've built for taxes and other costs and other related costs. And we're going to talk about that now. So the first one is federal sales taxes. We're not going to get into every province because there is um, different provincial standards across the country for retail sales tax or PST. So there are um, starting in Manitoba and going west, or sorry, Quebec also, sorry. Quebec has uh, QST, which is a provincial sales tax. And then from Manitoba west, some of the provinces also have RST, a retail sales tax, or a PST that's applicable just in their province. If you operate in one of those provinces, please look up the Ministry of Finance and determine if you have to collect and remit the PST or RST or QST for Quebec in that province. For our purposes, since we're, oh, I think, all in Canada, we're going to talk about GST and HST. So GST and HST is a federal tax. Okay, It's governed and collected and uh, you deal with the CRA, the Canada Revenue Agency, not the Ministry of Finance in every province. So the requirement to charge or collect GST or HST doesn't come into effect until you've hit $30,000 in sales or revenue within four consecutive calendar quarters. However, you can register at any time. So you can register from day one when you do your owner incorporation, you can then register for a GST account. Soon as you register though, you have to start collecting. Okay, so don't think that if you have a GST account but you haven't made 30,000 yet, then um, you don't have to collect. So you either, you either don't have a number until you hit 30,000 or you get your GST HST number and you start collecting right away that day, no matter how much you're making. So for example, Sally's a self-employed designer, let's say. She's based out of Ontario. Her business income in the last four quarters is what we have here. 9,500, 10,000, 10,000. And then on October 8th, Sally exceeds the $30,000 limit and she's no longer considered a small employer. 
sorry, a small supplier. She now has to collect HST on the supply that made her revenue go over 30,000. So, so on that thousand dollars. She then has 29 days to register with CRA and set up her GST HST account. So from then on, her next bill, for her, say her next um, billing is 10,000, it'd be 10,000 plus $1,300 of HST for Ontario. But remember, the biggest thing, biggest caution we always say is that $1,300 does not belong to Sally. She's collecting it on behalf of the CRA, okay? So you're doing a little bit of the government's work. I know everybody's rolling their eyes right now. <laughs> so, but, um, but that's the way it works with GST and HST and, and PST as well. You collect it on the government's behalf and then you remit it to them. But since you do that, they give you a little break. Many self-employed individuals do not realize that once there are a GST or HST registrant, they can now get back all of that GST or HST they've paid on business expenses. So although there's a little more work in keeping track of the GST and HST, it could save you money that could be significant. So if you do an owner um, incorporation and you know that you're going to put out a lot, you may not be bringing in a lot of money right away, but you have a lot of big expenses to start up, it could be, it'd be a really good idea to sign up as a GST, HST registrant. You get all of that money back. So you go to Staples, say in Ontario, and you spend $100 plus HST, so it's 113. If you're not registered, it costs you 113. If you are registered, well, it still costs you 113, but in the end, when you file your HST, you get that $13 back. So in the end, it only costs you $100. Okay, could be significant savings. What's important to note though, is that GST and HST is charged based on what they call the province of supply. So that's where you are billing, not where you are located. So for example, I am in Ontario and I have clients in British Columbia. I charge them 5% for just the federal tax. I don't charge the provincial tax because I'm providing a service, not a good. So my clients in BC, I charge them 5% GST. And then I have clients in Nova Scotia, I charge them 15% HST because in Nova Scotia, it's 15%. The customers that I have in the US, we charge no tax, okay? This is only in Canada. So you do need to, if you are going to operate in other provinces, and now with the way everyone's working, especially right now, um, it really is a global economy. People are working across the country, have clients across the country, customers, patients, whatever it is. So you do have to make yourself aware the onus is on you to be charging the correct rate. Okay, let's talk about income taxes. Everybody's least favorite topic now. Um, Self-employed. So if you are non-incorporated, so what June mentioned is a sole, like a sole proprietor, or you could be um, a partnership. If, if you are not incorporated, you report all your income on your personal tax return, your T1. Okay, the stuff we're doing right now. And on your T1, there is a form called a T2125. And that lays out the business activities where you put in your business name and your gross revenues, all your expenses. And then at the end, you have your net business income that you will be taxed on, on your personal tax return. And that adds on to any other income you have. So if you have investment income or rental income, any, or if you have other employment income, maybe you have a side hustle, like maybe you have a full-time job and this is your side hustle. So that's where, when we were talking about saving money for taxes, that's, this is where it becomes very important because your self-employment income could throw you into another bracket. So you have to be very, very careful. So that second point there where it says it's taxed at your marginal rate, that's going to be based on all of your income. Something that's really important to note that many, many self-employed people are not aware of is everybody in Canada pays into the CPP or Canada Pension Plan. In Quebec, they have the QPP. And the Canada Pension Plan changes and increases annually. If you've ever been employed and got a paycheck and a T4 at the end of the year, you'll see that your employer took off CPP and DI and taxes off every paycheck and, and you'll see it on your T4. 
what you may not realize is your employer also pays a portion of the CPP. The employer pays 100% of whatever the employee is paying. They match the employee's contributions. Unfortunately, when you're self-employed, you are your employer. So you have to pay both portions of the CPP. So in 2020 now, the CPP is 10.5% to a max of 57.96 per year. So make sure you're saving for that as well. We get so many people <laughs> that come to us saying, How, what, what happened here? I saved money for taxes, but now I owe another $5,000. And it's because of the CPP. Okay. CPP does change and increases annually. So be aware of that. It will not go down for a long time to our knowledge because it's grossly underfunded. So keep some money aside for the CPP if you are self-employed. Now, should you consider incorporating? Well, it depends on your cash flow needs. Just as I spoke of now, if you have other sources of income, if you're employed as well, you have to file both uh, personal and business taxes. However, it does allow you to defer tax. Never avoid tax. We live in Canada, we're not going to avoid tax. And it gives you some options. So you could pay yourself a salary, you could pay yourself a dividend and then you don't have to worry about the CP and, and payroll penalties. You could do a mix of both and allows you to keep some money in the business so that you potentially are paying lower taxes. So, my thing is not flipping. There we go. So how should you pay yourself? If you are incorporated, if unfortunately if you're not incorporated, if you're self-employed, all of your income just goes onto your personal tax return. If you are incorporated, you have some options. So what's the best option for an owner manager to distribute any excess profits? Should it be a salary or should it be dividends? Well, it depends. <laughs> oh, I love that answer. I feel like I'm a lawyer right now. Hope there's no lawyers out there, sorry. <laughs> so if the corporation pays a salary, there's some benefits you can receive. The salaries paid will be an expense in the corporation. So it could lower your taxable income and it leads to less taxes payable. So if you fall below the $500,000 um, taxable income, you get what's called the small business deduction and you pay very low taxes in the corporation. It paying out a salary also earns um, or it builds RSP room for you personally. It allows you to contribute to the Canada Pension Plan. So I know I made it sound terrible that you have to pay all this money to CPP, but don't forget, if you don't pay into CPP, you don't collect it. So when you turn 60 or 65, then you say, all right, I'm done. I want to, I'm going to start collecting my CPP. If you have not paid into it through the years, you will not collect anything. Okay. There's um, income tax will, will be withheld and remitted to the CRA. So at least you'll have some prepayment, so you don't have to worry about that surprise bill in April or June now. When you apply for a mortgage, uh, banks like to see steady and predictable income on a T4. There are other things like childcare expenses. So salary income can help, um, help you get this deduction because it goes against the lower income spouse's earned income. And then you get other tax credits, such as the Canada Employment Tax Credit and the CPP Credit, which are only available to salaried employees. A couple drawbacks is again, you know, you do have to pay both halves two times of the CPP, both portions of it. The corporation does have to set up what they call an RP, a payroll account with the CRA. So June mentioned the GST, HST accounts and the import, so that's an RP account. And then the import export accounts, which are the RZ accounts, you'd also need um, an RP account to go with your business number to collect those deductions. And generally, salaries are taxed at higher rates than dividends. So if the corporation pays you out a dividend, some of the benefits are that dividends are taxed at a lower rate than salary, which results again in you paying less personal tax. Okay? Dividends are not subject to payroll deductions, such as CPP and EI. So there's no contributions to the Canada Pension Plan 
So this is a significant savings for the corporation, but remember, you don't pay in, you don't collect. And there's more flexible payment options of when you can pay dividends out. A couple drawbacks of receiving a dividend is you will not build any RRSP room. So if you're young and you're looking to put money into RRSPs, it has to be on what they call earned income. Okay, dividends are more investment income because they're, they're, dividends are paid out of the equity of a corporation, not out of the, the income. Okay. There's no tax credits available to go against your dividend income. So dividend income is still taxable on your personal tax return. Okay, and you can't put RRSPs against it. You can't put tax credits. And then there's something that's called uh, the kitty tax that you just need to be aware of. Um, that dividends paid to children below the age of 18 can result in what we call a kitty tax. It's a tax on split income, where many people in the past used to set up trusts or pay their children a dividend as they'd make them shareholders in the corporation, just so they could um, get income out of the business at a lower tax rate. So the government said, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure your 10 year old isn't the CFO. So we're going to tax that dividend at the highest, the absolute highest federal rate. <laughs> okay. Just be aware. Um, so don't put your kids as shareholders unless they, they're of age and truly are shareholders. Uh, quarterly tax installments could be required if the taxes are more than 3000 in the year. So there could be more tax installments. So finally, um, there's some different deadlines that you should know about. Self-employed individuals operate on a calendar year. So if you're a sole proprietor or a partner, they must file their personal tax return by June 15th of the following year. But any taxes that are owing are owed are due by April 30th. This year, again, is the anomaly. Um, you've probably heard you have till June 1st this year to file and September 1st to pay. But um, normally, in a normal year, just so you're aware, that even though they tell you you don't have to file until June 15th, interest will start accruing after April 30th. Penalties will start accruing after June 15th. Corporations, though, operate on a fiscal year. So that's any 12-month period. And the corporation has to file their own tax return because they're their own legal entity. And they file a corporate T2 return within six months of their fiscal year. But if they owe corporate tax, it's due within three months of their fiscal year end. So for example, my fiscal year end is October 31st. So I have to file, I have to, I owe, if I owed any tax, it'd be um, due by the end of January. And, but I didn't actually have to file till April, but I did mine before the end of January anyway for my corporation, just to make sure that I didn't, I didn't want to be charged any interest. The government um, wants to make sure though you don't get too deep where you owe too much money at the end of the year. So when you owe more than $3,000 in the previous year for HST, income taxes, CPP, or any of that, quarterly installments will be required. Okay, so they will send you a letter. And if you don't make any installments, there, there are installment penalties. And we see them um, charge those installment penalties all the time. Okay, it is a good idea to make the installments though and just get some of that money out of the bank so you don't spend it. And finally, um, some more due dates. So again, just as I mentioned, these, these deadlines again have changed now for this year for the self-employed. But in general, for self-employed individual, your payment deadline is April 30th, your filing deadline for you and your spouse, uh, June 15th. And if you're incorporated, your payment has to be within three months after year end. You have your, your filing deadline is six months after your end. For HST, if you're, HST, if you're an annual filer, you have three months to file your HST. And if you're a quarterly filer, you have one month after your quarter ends to file your HST. So I know that was a ton of information. I have not been watching the chat, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, but I'm happy to, if, um, Jesse, if you guys have been watching the chat, if there's any questions or if anybody wants to speak up now, feel free. I'm happy to, to take any questions. Yep, so there are a few questions in the chat. Yep. yep. Can you see the questions? Um, I just got to pull up. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, so first question is. Well, um, I just don't know where to scroll up to. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. 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 The first question is, so we don't have to pay HST on the sales from Q1 to Q3. So that would be if, um, if you haven't, that's only if you're a non-registrant. No. So you have to start collecting, collecting GST or HST once you hit 30,000 in sales. That was just an example. Sorry, that was, that was just an example of, um, for somebody, it's not necessarily, you might hit 30,000 in your first quarter. So it's when you hit 30,000 in your last four quarters, you have to start collecting GST or HST and you have to register within a month. Okay, um, next question. How does HST work for rental income? Um, if you're a corporation, we do have many corporations that um, own rental properties. Depending on who you're renting to, like I pay HST on my rent. So business to business generally charges HST. Um, consumers generally don't pay HST on their rent. Uh, for Staples example, so the question is for the Staples example, the hundred dollars plus thirteen HST. When you deduct the expense, you deduct one hundred and thirteen. That's really good. If you're an HST, you deduct a hundred dollars. That goes again, and you put the thirteen in a separate account as HST receivable. That's what you're going to get back, the thirteen. If um, and if you are, if you're not an HST registrant, you deduct the hundred and thirteen. Now that may sound like the better deal to deduct the hundred and thirteen, but it's not. Because remember, your deduction is still going to only go at your marginal tax rate. So you're better off getting the $13 back in total than getting a, just a portion of that back in the taxes. Um, and it just says, if you're making sales in the U.S., do you have to pay income tax there as well? Um, I don't do uh, cross-border taxes, but I believe as long as you're not a resident or a U.S. citizen. So U.S. citizens still have to file no matter where they live as far as I know, um, but, it, but no, I have customers in the US and I just, I bill them either in Canadian or US dollars and they pay me and I do not have to file US taxes and I do not charge them HST. Um, Michelle asks, is CPP part of the deductions or included in the taxable income? That's a really good question. You, if you're in a corporation, you can deduct all the CPP and DI, your portion that you pay to employees. On, sorry, your portion for the employees. Um, do, you, do, do, do you recommend an app for digitizing receipts? Um, well, there is, so there is another related company to owner called Sorted. And I believe they're bringing in that feature. So Sorted is going to have, Sorted helps you get all your self-employment and small business income set up where you can link in your bank accounts and, and basically sort all your expenses, whether they're personal or business. And my understanding is soon that soon they're going to have uh, a receipt capture as well. So there's a couple other ones out there on the market, but um, if you're looking to, to bring in all your business income and expenses and, and keep track of it, sort it's really good for that. Um, Adam asks, I'll, um, I'll be a corporation launching mobile apps through the Apple App Store. Do you know if there's any additional taxes involved? Um, I don't know the app store directly, Adam, but I believe most of the time they do, they collect the taxes on your behalf. You still have to remit them. So we have a lot of clients, a lot of retail clients who sell through Amazon. And so Amazon will determine what tax you have, they have to charge. So if they're shipping your good out to BC, they'll charge the BC taxes. If they're shipping it out or they're selling, if they're selling your app to somebody in Nova Scotia, they'll charge 15%. So I'm not sure how the app store works, but I'm pretty sure they, they take care of charging the correct tax. You still are responsible for tracking that and remitting it. All right, we are at time. Uh, is there any more burning questions? If uh, you have them, feel free to put into the chat um, as the last call. Otherwise we will Thank Anna for your education. I know tax is one of those things, it's, com it's complex, but it's very important and it's super helpful. So thank you so much for educating us uh, this evening. Anytime.
No, for sure. Anytime. So, and thank you all for uh, staying with us. Uh, and learning together. I hope you have learned a couple of uh, things that you can apply to your business or future business. Thank you so much for participating in the chat with your questions as well. They're all really great questions. And in case you don't have uh, uh, the chance to ask more questions or if you have, uh, if you think of more questions later on about um, business tax, we will have future events. Um, and we also plan on give back to the entrepreneurial community. So we'll have more uh, events coming up and more information to update you. Be sure to follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So if you follow us, you will be uh, looped into our future plans. And before we wrap up, I just want to mention a couple of things in, in terms of uh, housekeeping. Someone asked at the beginning, so we have recorded the webinar and we will share the link with you after in, in case you want to look at it in the future and refresh your memory. We also love your feedback. So we have put out the link to a survey in this chat. You can click on that link and, and would love to hear from you. Only takes a couple of minutes to complete a few questions. Uh, we want to continuously put out better content for you in, in the future. And last but not least, uh, don't feel uh, don't feel hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions. I mentioned that Zoom can book a one on one consultation with you uh, to answer any business registration related questions. And don't worry if you can't remember all of the information above, we're going to send you an email uh, after the event. So all of the above information will be captured in there, including the webinar link. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Stay safe, stay home if you can, and uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Thanks everyone.